Hello, what a pleasure to be with you. I'd like to uh, thank IGS for this opportunity. Uh, today's presentation is on geosynthetic properties and testing. Uh, my name is Dr. George Kerner. I'm director of the Geosynthetic Institute here in Folsom, Pennsylvania, which is uh, right outside of uh, Philadelphia, USA. It's a little bit of my background. My PhD is in geotechnical engineering with a big emphasis on polymers. Um, I'm uh, heavily involved in geosynthetics for the last 35 years, and I hope I'll give you a bunch of uh, practical examples. Uh, this is an outline of the presentation today, an introduction. We're going to talk about properties, specimen preparation, give a bunch of uh, testing examples, and then uh, summary and conclusion. Um, should be a good uh, session, and uh, certainly if you have questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me by email. This is a little bit of an overview of the uh, session today. Um, certainly a lot of involvement, international involvement, with both uh, ISO, CEN, and AST. Standard organizations, these are the contact information, and uh, like I said previously, ISO has a strong hold on this through uh, TC-221. ASTM D35 has been uh, very involved and uh, meets two times a year. Um, also, the CEN involvement with uh, TC-189. Um, these organizations are open to everyone, and uh, certainly uh, your involvement in them is very much encouraged. Typical laboratory setup. Um, please realize that these laboratories, it's uh, rather prescribed. The uh, general requirements for competence of testing and calibration laboratories is specified in ISO 17025. This international standard is really what everybody has judged as far as compliance is concerned. Um, this uh, standard uh, really outlines um, resourcing and the process and management control of uh, laboratory tests and protocols. Um, it involves uh, specimen preparation uh, from roll goods into samples and then subsequently coupons and um, specimens are made from that. It uh, will go through um, physical, mechanical, hydraulic, uh, chemical fingerprinting and durability and then soil interaction and uh, we'll march through all this. Please realize that uh, all these test methods and there, there are hundreds of them uh, covered under the umbrella of geosynthetic. There are hundreds of um, well over 230 um, consensus uh, geosynthetic uh, standards or norms. Please realize that ISO 17025 would like you to have an internal reference material for each one of these um, test methods that you conduct. Um, you have to determine uncertainty, which means you not only have to get repeatability, but reproducibility um, from a, a master uh, database. So you're doing it internally as well as you're working with a group of others to um, get uncertainty. Why are we testing? Uh, we're testing for uh, multiple reasons. One is that you'd like to get conformance testing to a specification. Uh, you've purchased the material and you'd like to see if you've gotten what you've purchased. So uh, this conformance testing is occurring all over the world for job sites all over the world. Um, establish a statistical process control. This is typically done by the manufacturer in manufacturing quality control. All of these large geosynthetic manufacturers have facilities, laboratory facilities on site where they're uh, controlling their process and that control is uh, determined through quantitative testing. Performance testing is often used, particularly when you're pushing the envelope of a design. Um, this is important uh, when you're on the cusp of something new and also when you're uh, trying to save your client a, a bunch of money. So uh, this is uh, performance testing is done sometimes out in the field as well as done in the laboratory. And obviously there's uh, research and development work. Um, geosynthetics does not stand still. And there's quite a bit of R&D that's going on to improve materials, make them last longer, and uh, make them uh, work in very challenging environments. Uh, 
two main uh, types of testing. One is laboratory and the other is field. Uh, we'll uh, concern ourselves mostly with uh, laboratory testing in this discussion. If I would have to give an equation for an engineer, this would be it. It'd be the factor of safety equation with an allowable test property in the numerator and then a required design property or value in the denominator. Uh, please realize this discussion that we're having here will uh, concentrate on the test value in the numerator. Um, you will use test methods like I described in um, ISO, ASTM, or SEN. Uh, these should be consensus methods. The design models are typically uh, computer codes these days, but uh, that, that's what's used in the design. And the factor of safety is certainly application specific and uh, function specific as far as the various geosynthetics. There's a lot of availability in all three of these categories and uh, certainly you should pursue that um, to, to be informed and to stay with the current uh, state of the Please realize that geosynthetics are made up of formulations of polymers. Uh, they typically get tagged with the resin, the principal resin property, let's say high density polyethylene or linear low density polyethylene. But please realize there's a formulation involved with this. It's typically a uh, resin um, plasticizer filler, um, carbon black, and then an additive package. Um, there's also processing aids in this material, um, you know, for its use. So uh, you have to be cognizant of that. Uh, there are different qualities of uh, the additives as well as the base resin, and a good marriage of those two together uh, will typically lead to uh, good properties down the line. Okay, the properties that we're looking at are uh, physical, mechanical, hydraulic, and endurance properties. This is replete uh, through any engineer's uh, material, and uh, certainly uh, geosynthetics fall underneath that category. As far as physical properties are concerned, we have density or specific gravity, uh, mass per unit area, thickness, roughness or asperity, um, Stiffness, flexibility, drapeability, um, transparency or color is sometimes important, and then hardness or durometer. Uh, mechanical properties are can be in both uh, tension and compression, stress strain, modulus, toughness, the area under a stress strain curve, burst, tear, puncture, impact, friction, and pullout. Uh, the last two are, are sometimes even with uh, soil interactions. Hydraulic properties, uh, we're talking about porosity, percent open area, apparent opening or equivalent opening sizes, permeability, transmissivity. Permeability is cross-plane flow. Transmissivity is flow in the plane. Uh, soil retention or clogging. Uh, water and sol solvent uh, vapor transmission. This is becoming very important, particularly in the containment industry, while you're uh, containing, let's say, uh, VOCs or uh, methane. Endurance properties, and uh, this is really where I've made my hallmark. Uh, creep, abrasion, uh, environmental concerns, fatigue, chemical fingerprinting, um, TGA, OIT, Dynamic Mechanical Analysis, or Melt Flow Index. Um, the, the geosynthetics can be judged against these properties, and you can track them over time. There are degradation mechanisms involved with uh, aging of geosynthetics. Uh, it comes from the perspective of UV, radiation, uh, particularly uh, low-level radiation. Chemical, uh, high, uh, hydrolysis, swelling, extraction, delamination, oxidation, and uh, biologic. Uh, it's not biologic degradation, but uh, certainly you have to prove fitness of use in this regard. This is uh, quite involved. Uh, the geosynthetics, um, the standards, the norms have uh, taken a lot of use in this regard. And uh, it's really yeoman's work. Uh, by the people involved, and uh, they deserve a lot of credit for establishing this uh, really in a short period of time over the course of 35, 50 years. 
when the materials age, uh, typically the materials get stronger. This confuses some. You see the stress strain plot, the original, and then the incubated. Uh, you're looking at typically um, the stress being higher, but the strain being less. You also see an increase in modulus, which is represented by that straight line on the curve. So uh, this is the typical trend as far as the polymer aging is concerned. And how would you track that? You typically track that over time. Um, it's incubated time in a uh, weathering device. Um, you're looking for percent change with respect to time. Uh, in this particular case, I'm, I'm showing the comparison of the zero value um, with 30, 60, 90, and 120 days. You see the modulus increasing. You see the stress um, increase, and then some, sometimes it drops off. The strain, though, will decrease significantly over time. And that's probably your best tell or your first tell of how the material is changing over time. The thresholds at which you set um, these parameters are um, to the avail of the, the engineer. Um, it's certainly a compliance or a, it's a judgment call as far as the uh, specification in regards to these um, thresholds. Okay, each one of these tests that I'm going to describe to you um, requires a specimen uh, preparation. You're typically receiving geosynthetics from roll goods, uh, taking coupons across the roll width, and then subsequently uh, cutting out specimens in the machine and cross machine direction. You see three pic pictures here. I'd like to focus you on the center uh, photograph. Here you see a roll width by about a meter um, wide specimen and uh, coupons are cut out on the diagonal. From those coupons, specimens are cut um, and those specimens are actually tested. Obviously, if you were testing uh, mechanical properties, you would test in the machine and cross machine direction. The traceability of this is extremely important um, in a laboratory and good protocols need to be taken. On the left-hand picture, you see a, um, a die for cutting out membranes. The tolerances are quite tight on this. It's in regard regards to um, less than a percent uh, variation in the tolerance for the specifications uh, for the dies, the control of the dies. On the right hand side you see a large clicker press. Uh, these are the dies, the steel reel, reel dies which are typically used uh, to cut out um, geotextiles. Okay now I'd like to go into uh, physical examples uh, for physical testing. Uh, the easiest one for me to uh, relate to you is thickness, but it's not so easy. Uh, thickness, um, there are nine different thickness methods or norms in geosynthetics that I know of. Uh, this can vary from anywhere from a dead weight micrometer to uh, asperity thickness to uh, non-contact extensometers and also uh, screw type micrometers. Uh, you have a lot of variation uh, here in the method. Uh, it depends on the type of geosynthetics that you're testing. Membrane is different than textile. Textile is different than erosion control material is different than uh, drainage components. As far as a mechanical property example for you, uh, the easiest one to uh, show is the um, a stress strain property from a wide width tensile test in geosynthetics. Please realize that you're going to use a continuous rate of extension machine. This uh, continuous rate of extension machine has a set of grips on it. I'm showing uh, four different types of grips here. Uh, this has evolved over time with a lot of learning from past experience. Um, what you're generating from the stress strain curve with these specific grips is, uh, is a plot like this. Um, you can use um, grips with contact extensometers or non-contact extensometers to generate this stress strain curve. Um, you'll have to be prescripted and typically you're using an accredited lab for this. Again, you're um, looking at stress and strain. Uh, most often um, the, the modulus and the modulus of the material at one, two, five, seven percent is uh, recommended. Uh, 
um, especially when you're going to wide width tensile tests of reinforced materials, whether it be uh, geogrids or geotextiles. Very important in the um, test setup, uh, preload, uh, specimen preparation, and measurements which are taken during this test. But uh, certainly uh, it's a learned skill. Um, you need a laboratory that's done this in the past and uh, can show proficiency at uh, conducting the test methods. In addition to uh, stress strain or tensile properties, you could have tear properties. There's several different uh, tear methods out there. Um, here you see the contrast of uh, three different tear methods, the trouser tear, the graves tear, and the trapezoidal tear, all demonstrated in these slides. But uh, it, it, it's involved. You have to specifically ask um, what, what you're looking for, and these materials, whether they be scrim reinforced or uh, geotextile or uh, geomembrane, uh, each one has a different um, method, which is optimal uh, for uh, testing uh, from both the perspective of um, QC as well as QA. Puncture testing, and this one is extremely involved. Um, the, in, particularly in containment, you can't have uh, puncture issues. But uh, puncture strength uh, for different materials, uh, linear low density has a much uh, different response than HDPE. I tried to contrast them uh, here with you. You see the uh, tremendous elongation with uh, linear low density. I'd love for somebody to do uh, puncture toughness, uh, which is really what we're looking at. It's not ultimately puncture strength, but puncture toughness, which I, I think we're uh, after as an industry. But uh, this would be a move in our Comparison of different index puncture tests. Uh, you see here pyramid puncture um, versus pin puncture and CBR puncture. All of them are addressed in uh, ISO uh, uh, standards and uh, certainly are, are good to uh, for use in uh, the different application areas. We not only have the puncture methods, which I described earlier, but there are dynamic or impact puncture as well. Uh, shown here in the slides, uh, which are, uh, can be availed to you, particularly if the application uh, calls for it. Puncture out in the field, though, uh, could be uh, significantly different. Um, you can have puncture from above with, let's say, uh, a granular aggregate over top of a liner system, or puncture from below, let's say, a stone in the subgrade. Uh, can we simulate this in the laboratory? course is the answer. There are several methods and I'll show you two uh, very different ones. One is off of a pressure uh, vessel with a pump and then these indicators. Uh, we're typically using truncated cones so that we can get repeatability on this. Here you see the typical response. In the upper photo it's uh, HDP. In the lower photos on the right it's linear load density and you can see a, a very big uh, variation. In the left hand side you can see the puncture of the, the three cones, the truncated cones by themselves, and in the lower slide you can see it with uh, puncture protection material being a, a stout needle punch non-woven geotextile. These response curves are, are shown a uh, failure puncture, an actual uh, breach of the material versus cone height. And you see the different responses for HDPE, PVC, and then linear low density polyethylene. That critical cone height has changed from around 20 millimeters uh, and pushed all the way beyond 80 millimeters for the linear low density polyethylene. Very different responses based on the, uh, the type of material. To further push the, the envelope, you see the HDP curve now in blue by itself. And now we've helped out the uh, response, the puncture response by ever increasing mass per unit area geotextiles. Uh, and this is certainly where the in industry has gone. We want to uh, protect the geomembranes, which aren't fragile, but uh, certainly uh, we can't puncture them and anticipate that they would behave well as uh, containment issues. 
to further push the envelope, uh, we have uh, greater demands um, from industry as far as long-term performance of um, containment geomembranes. And this is in regards to uh, limiting the amount of strain that the geomembrane would see out in the field. Uh, typically, what you're uh, seeing in the field is a cross-section uh, like this. You have a low permeability material going from the bottom up, which is either a GCL or a CCL. The geomembrane, then a puncture protection layer, which is typically a heavy needle punch non-woven. And then coarse gravel over top of it for a leachate collection and removal system. Can we model this in the laboratory? And uh, the answer is yes. It's a resounding yes. Here's a device which is uh, used often in Europe. Um, very nice uh, papers in regards to this um, uh, work. Uh, a lot of it conducted at the bomb in Germany. Um, what they have in this cross section is underneath the uh, geomembrane, they uh, typically have a, a very soft metal plate. And this soft metal plate, which is extremely thin, is uh, made out of tin. And then subsequently after the test, they can analyze the uh, plate for deformation and track how much uh, strain is in the material. So uh, there it shows you the complexity from an index test to a performance test as far as puncture is concerned. And I submit to you that most of the testing that we see can be uh, can, can be extrapolated like this as well. Now going into hydraulic examples, um, hydraulic properties, particularly for geotextile filters, uh, we see things like AOS or EOS, uh, parent opening area or equivalent opening size. Uh, we can do it through dry sieving, wet sieving, and also through a, a pyrometer. All of these things, all of these methods have been standardized in our industry. Uh, holding the specimen is uh, critical, particularly when you're dry sieving, and uh, certainly uh, the static electricity associated with things is important as well. Typical response curves uh, from geotextile opening sizes. Uh, you see on the left-hand side, the uh, blue curve is just a threshold. So they're giving a, um, uh, a parent opening size in regards to um, 95 or 5% passing line. Uh, in, in contrast to that, um, they're giving the full curve from the parameter, uh, which you saw in the previous slide. And here you have the entire distribution, both of which can be used for uh, filter design. I submit to you that the entire curve is uh, much better for this analysis. That's cross-plane flow. You're using uh, the uh, the opening size of the textile to do your, um, your, your, your filter design, which is a contrast of uh, permittivity cross-plane flow versus opening size. In contrast to that, this is flow in the plane of the geosynthetics. And um, here is a series of various geocomposites. These geocomposites are... Um, are typically uh, made up of a, a spacer or a net and a, a geotextile on the outside, which behaves as a filter. We're looking for in-plane flow or hydraulic transmissivity. This is a, a transmissivity unit. It uh, consists of three major component parts. There's a reservoir box, a specimen holder, and then an outlet weir. Um, pardon me, you can keep, um, you can control um, normal pressure on here as well as hydraulic gradient. And uh, that's usually what's uh, used. You saw the uh, photograph uh, in the previous slide. This is a cross section. Uh, the specimen holder, uh, typically uh, you, you have uh, superstratum and uh, substratum, which you uh, can control. Um, there are um, uh, standardized soils, as well as uh, foams to simulate uh, soils, which are, are used in, in both those categories, or some manufacturers run it with uh, rigid plates, top side and bottom, for uh, quality control check. 
Um, again, you, your two parameters which you uh, can modulate are normal pressure on the specimen and hydraulic gradient. Um, the relationship is a uh, flow relationship from uh, Darcy's formula, Q is equal to KIA, and here we get the transmissivity uh, knowing the flow rate the um, the width and then subsequently the the grade of the specimen. Um, you're looking at uh, response curves for this transmissivity test, and they're broken down into uh, three different categories. Uh, the first uh, figure up in the upper left hand side is a biplanar uh, geonet sandwiched between uh, two uh, geomembranes. And uh, looking at their flow response, that's uh, flow rate versus normal pressure. Then you're looking at a um, the, the same uh, thickness of a biplanar geonet, but it's sandwiched between uh, two needle punch non-woven textiles. So the response is quite a bit different. In regards to the lower uh, curve, you're looking at a uh, flow rate with respect to time. Um, it's a, a creep uh, scenario with a sustained load on it. So I'm sorry they're so small. I even had to take my glasses off. But uh, these are the typical response curves that you, um, you, you see from the transmissivity unit. Going further to uh, soil interaction, uh, the best one that I could show you is a, a direct shear apparatus. Uh, any geotechnical engineer would know uh, the more Coulomb failure criterion. Um, you're looking at um, a uh, shear strength versus a normal plot. You will develop a, a failure envelope. Uh, the friction angle is actually the slope of this failure envelope, and the y intercept is the uh, cohesion. For us in geosynthetics, it's typically an adhesion response, uh, which we're looking at. The uh, governing equation uh, for the, this slope line is uh, linear uh, regression and uh, certainly uh, uh, known to, to all of us. The, uh, the device, this is a cross-section of the device, the direct shear device, and it's really uh, two box halves. Um, normal pressure can be applied, and typically you're monitoring uh, shear strength versus displacement. Uh, there's also some monitoring uh, as far as uh, vertical displacement if uh, the latency is uh, of interest. You certainly need a uh, frictionless plane underneath the box, and uh, certainly this box needs to be calibrated in regards to any of the measuring devices. Here you see it in schematic form, the two box halves in the, the upper ISO and the bottom cross section. There are many uh, boxes available. Uh, these boxes are uh, large. Uh, the, the boxes are 300 millimeters by 300 millimeters at a minimum, and usually the lower uh, sled is uh, quite a bit longer so that you can uh, accommodate um, deformation at least up to uh, 25 percent. The clamping or gripping um, of the frictional surfaces is extremely important. You can have front, side, and bottom and back clamping associated with this. It's all uh, equipment specific, but uh, extremely important to the uh, response curves. generated. Again, the frictionless uh, surface um, the standards are not prescriptive in regards to how you uh, get a frictionless surface. There are many different ways to do that with linear bearings, um, roller chases, uh, Teflon, grease Teflon, uh, but you, you, you need to have that frictional, frictionless surface and uh, certainly have to control it over time with uh, significant normal pressures. As far as measuring the actual shear strength in the box depends heavily on the normal pressure. Uh, you have to be within 10 to 90% of the load range um, for this measurement. And obviously you're gonna use an LVDT or an electric monitoring device for displacement. 
Normal pressure can be applied many different ways, and again, it's not prescriptive, so you need to know the uh, normal pressure range that you're in. Uh, this is quite a bit different, let's say, if you're designing a landfill cover versus a uh, landfill liner. Um, we can use uh, dead loads, moment arms, hydraulic pistons, or air bladders. Again, it's uh, not prescriptive on what you have to use, but uh, most of the accredited labs know that they uh, what range they need to be in and uh, what works best for their situation. This is a, a typical or an ideal response curve, a, a stress drain versus displacement plot. You're typically running at a minimum three normal pressures, low, middle, and high. Uh, you're looking at two portions of the curve. First of all, the peak, and then subsequently the post-peak or residual value. That peak should be crisp. Um, you should um, have a, a nice response curve where you can pick out the uh, peak versus the residual. Um, some interfaces give you a much cleaner uh, peak than others. From that uh, shear strength versus displacement plot, you're going to plot up shear strength versus normal pressure. You'll have three points that will uh, can be developed into the peak curve and then a subsequent three points which can be developed into the residual curve. Um, backing off again the slope of uh, both the peak and the residual and that's typically the uh, take-home number from the direct shear. To show you how this is used in an actual application I wanted to go to a, a case history. This particular case history is a, a three to one slope Therefore, the beta angle on the slope is uh, 18.4 degrees. The cross section is a uh, PVC geomembrane with a uh, composite on top of it. And that composite is a uh, drainage composite. And then there's subsequently soil over top of uh, that composite. And this is a uh, landfill cover. This is the site, and we knew that we were in trouble down at the uh, tow swale because there was a gathering of material. This gathering of material was uh, quite pronounced and showed that there was quite a bit of movement on the upper slopes. Sure enough, this was the case. Uh, we had a significant rain on site, and there was uh, about a, a, a meter worth of, um, or three meters of movement at the uh, the crest of the slope. The interface that uh, moved, you can see there, and uh, showed a little bit of uh, slick and slides movement. <coughs> Pardon me. Here we see a, a typical response curve of uh, PVC against a needle punch non-woven geotextile. In the upper plot, this is a massive database for that interface, and we're seeing a peak value of around 20 degrees with a residual value in the neighborhood of about 16 degrees. So let's back up and see how this is uh, used for, a, uh, for design. And here you see uh, the design, uh, this cover soil stability, and this is for a, a uniform cover. Uh, we went went through the analysis for 19, 18, 17, 16, and 15. And you can see that factor of safety at 19 degrees is only about uh, a little over one. Uh, most geotechnical engineers wouldn't tolerate anything less than about 1.3. This uh, designer really let it hang out there. And uh, certainly, uh, it's no surprise that this interface uh, failed over time. We did not even put a, a seismic or hydraulic load on this. Uh, this uh, facility was on the cusp of failure um, right from the beginning. In regards to uh, chemical fingerprinting and durability, uh, I'd like to give you a couple different examples, uh, which I'll show you here. Uh, these are um, often considered to be um, reduction factors or partial factors of safety. One is uh, UV degradation. This UV degradation in the laboratory can come in the form of uh, UV fluorescent, xenon arc, or um, oven aging. Oven aging is not a UV. It's just a degradation mechanism through heat. But uh, again, you can use time to temperature superposition or just an exposure for a uh, 
single uh, side. Um, what you're typically doing for olefins is doing a, a standard or high pressure OIT um, through uh, differential scanning calorimetry. You would like to see what the baseline material or how the baseline material behaved and then subsequently look at how it's behaving after exposure uh, and track that over time. Next, what we look at is uh, creep, creep rupture, accelerated creep, time temperature superposition, and stepped over isothermal method. Um, please realize creep is the Achilles heel of polymers. Uh, polymers do not corrode, but they, uh, they do creep. So uh, you have to be cognizant of that and design for it. Um, it's important uh, for reinforcement applications, and our goal here is to establish a creep uh, reduction factor so that we can use that in design. We'll actually cut back the ultimate value um, to an allowable value with this creep reduction factor, and it's usually one of the uh, largest reduction factors uh, with polymer material. Generalized uh, creep responses, you see two um, curves here. One is at 20% uh, creep load, and the other is at 60. Uh, the olefin plastics, uh, PE and uh, polypropylene, po polyethylene and polypropylene, um, creep uh, significantly more than the uh, polyamides or uh, polyesters. Need to know that, and certainly can design around it but uh it's 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 significant in uh, regard to the reduction factor conventional creep is uh, shown here these are typically uh, large loads which are placed off of a specimen in an environmentally controlled chamber um, it's a, a percentage of the ultimate tensile strength of the material and then what you're looking for is uh, deformation over time this uh, deformation over time plot is uh, manifests itself into a uh, strain versus time plot. Uh, you see them uh, here for an HD geo, HDPE geogrid, which is used in reinforcement, a uniaxial uh, geogrid, and uh, the response curve here are for uh, 10,000 hours. So the uh, the curve is or the the time commitment is uh, rather on, onus. That um, thousand hour uh, data would need to be extrapolated three orders of magnitude to give you over a hundred year design, which most of these facilities want. 10,000 hours uh, gives you two orders of magnitude extrapolation to get you, it to you. The American Society of Civil Engineers only allows one order of magnitude extrapolation uh, for the design. Therefore, you'd need 100,000 hour conventional creep data. Um, that represents almost 14 years of time to get the over 100 year prediction. I submit to you this is very long. Don't let me leave you with uh, the impression that this is not done. There are some manufacturers who have this data for their material and haven't changed their formulation. But I tell you, conventional creep is quite a commitment as far as uh, time and uh, materials is concerned. So the question is, do we have something better or do we have something that we can use to supplement that? And the answer is yes. I'm going to show you a couple different ways. One is with time temperature superposition, uh, which greatly affects things. Uh, commercial equipment is available. It runs under the assumption that higher the temperature, the shorter the testing time, and also the greater projection of time. There is a temperature limit, however. You can't get too close to the glass transition temperature of these polymers and still have uh, good shifting. So uh, you have to keep that in mind. You can take, you, you, you can't take this to the extreme as far as temperature is concerned to make the time very short. What we're looking at is generating a, a master curve from a, a litany of different samples. This is log strain versus time. And you can see how that shift has occurred. Each uh, T1, T2, T3, and T4 prime are all uh, shifted uh, based on uh, different temperatures. 
So uh, you're running uh, different specimens at different temperatures. This is the uh, typical um, equipment which is used for that. And uh, it's, it's held by uh, many different laboratories around the world. Uh, previous method uh, it, it goes for horizontal shifting. Um, alternatively, you can convert the modulus and shift things. There is a, a shift factor which uh, certainly can be analyzed. And uh, this, has, this procedure has also been standardized, um, which is, was, was quite, achieve, uh, quite an achievement. To further push this, uh, we've gone to stepped isothermal method. The previous time temperature superposition uh, requires a new sample for each test, where uh, sim testing requires one specimen and to take it through a pace of um, temperature steps. Um, the time temperature superposition has a uh, variability due to product where sim testing does not. It uses the same specimen, so that's quite an advantage. Uh, this is the equipment that's used for sim testing. Again, um, standardized for both tension and compression. Uh, it's a fabulous advancement in regard to um, cre testing. Uh, this shows a comparison of stepped isothermal versus time temperature superposition. Um, we sh show the uh, limits, and I think this is extremely good uh, agreement between the two uh, methods for this uh, particular procedure. Observations about creep. I think conventional creep will always uh, continue to be used um, and demanded uh, for uh, critical application. Time temperature superposition and stepped isothermal appears to be in agreement and uh, could be the future of use, especially for uh, compliance. Um, interpretation of the data is critical and standardization of that has been done. So uh, these methods are well on the way to answering how much is the material going to creep and what creep factors of safety should I use. Okay, that was a lot uh, real quick, but uh, I did my best to uh, cover a lot of ground. Uh, in regards to uh, submarine conclusion, in regards to uh, testing and properties, I really think uh, geosynthetics uh, work well, but they're, uh, they're tricky. And uh, tricky in regards, they need to be installed um, well and installed right the first time. Uh, and Geosynthetics aren't, aren't good with Band-Aid approaches. So you really need to balance this uh, testing and design. I hope I showed you this vignette over the course of an hour uh, to give you an idea of the testing involved. And it, it's very well complemented by the design. Uh, we've been testing successfully for um, 50 years now in geosynthetics. And uh, they've made great strides um, I suggest that you use a, a quality system approach with an accredited testing facility, um, certainly to conduct your test. Uh, you have to ask that these uh, laboratories are controlled and that they know the uncertainty and risk associated with the results that they're providing. I think index tests uh, do not always simulate field performance. Index tests are fine for controlling um, the product in a manufacturing facility, but um, we have to go, we need to do uh, more performance testing um, to get really good handles on partial factors of safety and to guard us against uh, any shortcomings or uh, problems out in the field. I'd also like to give you a pitch to get involved with these uh, standards organizations, whether they be uh, CEN, ISO, or ASTM. Um, these, these organizations need new blood, and there's uh, certainly plenty of activity to uh, go around where uh, people can help and advance the industry. I'd like to thank you so much for participating. Uh, there's a lot of contact information uh, here on this slide, um, certainly that you could reach out to uh, the IGS um, in, in many different ways. You're welcome to reach out to me at the uh, Geosynthetic Institute. 
um, I'm certainly a member of IGS and uh, I'll help you, I'll service you in any way I can in regard to testing. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. I hope it was informative and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Take care now. Thank you.